sent you a talk that I did the day before yesterday at the uh, AR event. Again, so I was in the, in the art cluster, um, and I didn't call the presentation AR and art. I called it uh, Invisible Augmented Reality, because I like the title better. There will be some Invisible Augmented Reality in the talk. You can spot it. I think there will be at least three. A little bit about my own background. I did um, computer science first, a long time ago, and then um, Art Academy, the Kenneth Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam. Um, and while I was at that academy, um, the Second Life came along, this virtual world. Maybe if we lower the lights, would that be better? We could turn them off completely and people promise not to fence them. Because we don't have any lamps in here. I think we will. Oh, this is better. Is this better? Mm -hmm. yeah. Not for videography. <laughs> um, so in, when I started that school, I was still making artworks that had this, but then you cannot film That's anymore, okay. right? It's OK. But, well, anyway, I was making these artworks that you could easily transport. You know, that was the main criteria. But then in this virtual world, I could suddenly create things that were beyond any limits, um, bigger than, than what you could imagine. Only the thing is, it's, it's always then within that screen. And I got a lot of um, arguments with people saying, hey, it's, it's, it's too small. and it's always within the screen, so I was trying to, to get out of that screen actually immediately. For example, using yeah, mobile phone connections to this, this virtual world, to the outside world, organizing walking tours and things like that. And I even created really complicated um, big installations like this one. On the left you see a, a sort of hydraulic platform, a huge thing, and it, it was measuring uh, weight. And at the same time, there was in this virtual world an extension of the same platform. And it was measuring the weight of these virtual characters. Um, and it moved in a synchronous way. So it, it was a way to really make these virtual people just as real as real people. It didn't really matter if there would be real people on the other side or virtual people. But then all kinds of reality came along, which was for me even, yeah, it was perfect. Because now I didn't have the need for this, this complex machinery anymore. I could just put objects in the real world, you can see them using your phone. Like for example this one, this is a, a safari tour through a city of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Um, it's one of my first AR projects where I put virtual animals all over the city, uh, like lions near the central station and a big elephant on some square. And I had a really huge safari vehicle and I was driving people around. Um, and they could be spotting the animals using their phone. And in the car was safari. Uh, but there was animal sounds there, so it, it was really like a safari where you had to be um, yeah, spotting the animals using your phone. I think, yeah, my opinion is that, that actually the, the, the possibilities now are infinite, are endless. If you, um, if you can just put objects or items anywhere in the world based on a GPS coordinate, uh, then you can create things like this. This is the biggest interactive sculpture in the world. It exists in the skies all over the globe. It's about seven billion blocks that are there. They're here as well at this moment. And when you, you click one, you can change the color. So for example, this is then uh, Times Square in New York. You can change the color and then all blocks all over the globe change, uh, the color change. So it's a sort of, uh, let's say, global communication gadget. It doesn't really make sense, but it's, it's fun to know that, hey, uh, three minutes ago, somebody in Tokyo changed the color of this whole thing. And actually, I'm, I thought, okay, it's big, but it's not big enough. Let's make it bigger. Where's this big R? Uh, that's the title, by the way. I'm, I'm now making it um, expand one virtual meter every day. So at one point, it will be uh, the biggest work in the universe, and it will be so big that you can't see it anymore. You'll be looking with your phone to the skies, and you'll know that there's this AR work there, but you, yeah, you can't really see it <laughs> And then it, it, it's sort of mental AR again. Um, because I, I think they are actually, it, it's, a, it's an old discipline where you have to mentally think of something that's not there, but now with AR it's, it's become more easy to see it. So in this way you bring back this old discipline again. I think, I, I, I also thought of the term, when, when you have this virtual 3D with this infiniteness, and you combine that with the physical 3D, then you get 3D. I would like to call it 3D because there's really no more limits in what you can do and or where you do things, which, um, yeah, this example shows really well that that's the case. This is a virtual object, a balloon, that's placed inside the Oval Office of Obama in his, uh, yeah, in, in the White House. 
and on the balloon are uh, Twitter messages being displayed. So when you tweet with uh, the hashtag of office chat, they are here on this balloon, and this balloon is in the office of Obama. So if he would grab his phone, you would see this thing in his face. There's yeah. <laughs> There's no one inside the Pentagon press room. It's sort of an uninvited public screen. So if you are a journalist and think, well, let's, let's, let's tweet about this. Other people can see it on that balloon as well. I'm still hoping for the first screenshot coming from that uh, space. And these, these two items were placed at these locations during the event. It was called Infotrack. And we set up a huge command center uh, with live uh, Google Map projections. And on that map, we showed where our balloon was being viewed. We kept it as a secret, fully, fully secret, until a certain day, and we started tweeting um, and posting messages on Facebook about an infiltration going on in the White House. And we, we hoped to sort of trigger an alertness at the other side of the world, and we were viewing the views, and it worked somehow. There was, at a certain moment, there was this red dot appearing near the White House. And the funny thing is that there was this crowd of people yeah, we were sort of yelling like, hey, we did it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a red dot. You know? it's, there's nothing spectacular. It's not an yeah, animated dinosaur flying around. No, it's a red dot and it gives you some excitement. So <laughs> I think AR can be very visual, very um, like traditional, but you can also think of meta AR experience where you're actually not, yeah, you don't need to have the, the, the difficult visual component. There's another example of, of this, which is um, a project that's now running. It's, it's called the, uh, um, yeah, the Personal Virtual Stone. I'm spreading around these flyers. I don't know if you, if you have them here as well, but in the Netherlands you often find this in your, in your, your mailbox. So Google tells you to um, yeah, be able to solve all your problems, whatever. And I copied that style and I made it into a personal stalker that's guaranteed to be stalking you from the moment on that you switch on the layer and viewing. You, you see part of the stalker here, and from that moment on, you're in the database, um, and you're being stalked. And what you don't know is actually that the whole world is watching you at that time. Because the thing with, with GPS-based AR is the server knows where you are. You have a GPS for it. So I created this, this platform, which is um, being updated all the time. So whenever a new person is viewing a stalker, he is on top of the list, and there's this automatic Google Street View window opening immediately. So you can really look at the location where that person is, so you can type in a message that's, that's very relevant to that location. For a person being stalled, it, it's a strange feeling. You're alone in the street, and somebody yeah. knows what's on the shop window. <laughs> might, might, might be scary, I don't know. It's, it's, it's one week old, so it's still a bit in development. Um, every AR presentation has an image like this. I, I, I just, yeah, uh, I know because I went to this AR event, so this is my image. And this image is then always used to tell that, that it used to be possible. This whole AR is not new, but it used to be looking like this, and you had this, this big computer on your back. And now that's not the case anymore, you just have your phone, which really makes a big difference. You can now develop things, and you can just say that they exist. This is something I'm developing um, in the Netherlands with the V2 Institute. Uh, it's, it's, it's playing tic-tac-toe with 20,000 people in a football stadium. Um, and what's needed there is just saying that, that you can play that game on the field. People can then uh, open up the, the, the layer, you have to download the layer application. Um, you can battle to, yeah, with someone who goes out the same. What? Yeah, that, that could be. Well, well, this is a very, this, this is sort of one way um, hack of the football field. But of course, we, we're also working on this now. Um, there's this programmer working on tracking software. But if you know where these football players are, um, they can also create new game formats. <laughs> new game formats where it's, it's, it's fully integrated. And you, you don't need to stick to the football game. Um, personally, I, I think I want to create a, a game where you're actually following the referee. And if you put goals, certain points on the field. If the referee runs through this goal, you can score a point. So there's going to be this new reality in the football stadium where people are getting enthusiastic or yelling um, yeah, at wrong moments. But it's their reality at that time. Um, 
this is another example where by just saying that something is there, it is there. I turned the city of Dortmund into a virtual construction ground by putting up these signs um, all around the city, stating that you just needed your iPhone, download the app, and open Dortmund. And then you were given a sort of a building tool, a big Lego box, you can imagine, and you could place them around in the city. And it's, that's me using it. And some people are still a bit strange. Or, yeah, looking at you like, what's he doing? Um, and it's a collaborative space. That, that's also very important to, to notice. You can build things. And yeah, this is a special location where there was a visualization of what was actually being built. But if you create a cube, then somebody else can build on top of that cube. You can really collaborate, collaborate in this shared space. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, it, it might look very static to have a cube as well as a and if you switch off your phone, then you see nothing anymore. But I've also been working on uh, situations where actually the things you're, you're placing are, are having this life on their own. This is um, sort of real life, game of life. It's a very good principle where you have sort of computer living things. Um, each dot lives on when there's enough dots around it. And now you can actually have it live around you on the street. You can be standing amidst this virtual life. And that, that, that is still, I mean, it, it's a projection on the street and only you know about it. it. It's getting interesting when you have a situation like this. This is the world, world's first augmented reality flash mob that we had last year in April. Um, and actually, it was my very first AR project, and at that time I didn't know the technology at all. But I thought, hey, is it interesting? I want to get to know about it. Let's just say that there's this flash mob in two weeks' time. Um, let's say that I will be having the, the printed AR codes there and let people bring the real technique. And that's what happened, especially after Bruce um, posted it on his Beyond blog. Beyond then okay, I was immediately reached by people from Layer saying, hey, we have to get in touch with the people of SNDRV. Um, and then it, it, it really um, yeah, got into some events. What you see in the middle is, is, is a bunch of virtual characters forming a, a virtual flash mob. But those people around it were actually forming a sort of secondary flash mob. So I, I think it was an example of when this virtual world was really having an yeah, impact on this physical world that we live in. And then you, yeah, you get to the question, um, is that what you want? You know, if people are living in these virtual realities all the time, is that going to be very complicated? Are there going to be signs saying, okay, please no virtual reality here, let's stay in, in one reality until we know what we are talking about? And, and more important, what does it mean for space, especially inside a museum, for example? That's what I uh, asked myself. And I, I uh, photoshopped this image and I put it on Twitter. And after a while, I got an email from Mark Scrag in New York. He's, he's teaching augmented reality classes there. He went to the wall and he wanted to photograph the sign to talk about it with his students. And then he emailed me saying, hey, what is this sign? Uh, it's not there, Mama doesn't know about it. And I said, no, that's true. But let's see, maybe maybe we can make it real by just um, yeah, planning an exhibition inside the museum and see where that leads to. So that's what we did. We made some open call. Um, I was inviting people around me to submit words. And we had an uh, opening inside the MoMA on the 9th of October. That's what you see here. And the moment didn't know anything about it, actually. <laughs> we didn't tell him. No. We just, we, we, we were there the, a few days before the opening and we put all these artworks um, at specific locations. We were looking at the best spots because it was also a very important moment when um, yeah, you're working with this high-tech technology and every artist saying, well, it's, it's not real. It's, it was not really accepted yet. And then you think, hey, if you then put it inside the museum, they have the right context, so you can really judge if this AR art works inside a yeah, place like that. So we had specific uh, floors for 2D art. There was really great 3D art in the atrium. Um, this was a thing that was surrounding you uh, when you looked around on the phone. Uh, I put back, back into the MoMA, also as a sort of reference to the fact that this is something that has also been going on for a long time, people putting things inside the museum, so it's sort of uh, old and I don't mind. Anyway, I want to back, back into the museum. And yeah, of course, it, 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 yeah. 
the, 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 the shot could be there without Bruce, sort of uh, AR guru. So we have him in the lobby, um, and the balloon is displaying a live Twitter feed of his messages. Uh, I, I don't think it's active still, but, but he's still in the lobby here. <laughs> there. Oh, and I extended the museum with the seventh floor. <laughs> they, they haven't won yet. Um, and we also decided to, to leave the whole exhibition there because it's not in the way. I mean, it's virtual space, so there can be many different spaces at the same location, no problem. So it's still there. If you're in the museum, you can still visit it. It, it shows that there's actually really no borders, not no walls, but also no country borders or no no physical borders anymore. And I've been experimenting with that as an artist, for example, I also wanted to do something in a turbine hall in London. It's a sort of very prestigious, prestigious place and it's really big. So I thought if you put AR there, then it would look really big. Uh, and then I made a physical controller and it's actually that really small. So this is a, a disco ball controller where you can control the rotation of a disco ball, which really makes no sense at all because it's a round thing. So it, it's a sort of proof that, that there's no space safe anymore. And this is a result actually of the moment show. It's a sort of a group of artists performed after this show. It's called Manifest Star. We really enjoyed what, what, what happened there. We, we felt that the art world should see more of this. And we decided to be at the Biennial. Since the Biennial is really uh, the, the big art show in Venice, it's really structured in the country, in sort of country scheme. But we come from all kinds of countries, so we, we think there's now this global augmented reality space that deserves its own pavilion. Yeah. So that we, that's what we are now preparing. I think it's approximately going to be there. Sort of, uh, we're doing AR tours to show people there um, the available artworks. And, and this is my producer code to me. It's a sort of a pavilion and battle. People outside of the, the Jardini um, can put virtual pavilions of countries that are not the Jardim yet. Uh, they can place them inside the Jardim and people inside can view them in open fields but then delete them because that, that's still missing view. A lot of people can add to the virtual space but you can, uh, you can never delete them. So this is the first time you can actually delete stuff again too. So I think as an artist I, I use AR in three ways. First I, I use it to make things possible like this mobile show. Uh, and I also use it to make things like this, this enormous sculpture bigger. It's just possible now thanks to AR. But I also like to explore what it actually means. What, what kind of medium is it? What, what are the borders or boundaries of this medium? And yeah, you, you want to, to find out these really strange aspects of it. For example, what's happening at GPS coordinate 0, dot 0. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it happens to be a, a, a point on the Earth where yeah, mis miscoded AR stuff is ending up. <laughs> when, you, when you enter your your your, your object, but you uh, mistake the GPS coordinates, then sometimes it's at zero dot zero, and you can actually list objects that are at this point in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> so there's this, this swimming pool, and there's, there's some some dating people that will never get a date. <laughs> We're still thinking of, of how to access that space uh, and, and visualize it, but. Will come, and this is not. Oh, it's a bit hard to see, but um, AR is about. But uh, yeah, you, you see something, and it's not really there. But on the other hand, it is there, and this is even more complex. This is uh, 3D objects positioned in a 2D situation to be making a shape. That's a representation of 3D. You see the, on the right upper corner. That's the composite layer. So these objects are around you. You think you see what you see, but actually there's something you don't see yet. And I'm still what you see in the compass. It's also not, not true, it's still a representation of what you think you see. Yeah, let's, let's leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> this is my, uh, my latest work. Um, yeah, it's, it's one pixel. And thanks to AR, thanks to this, this yeah, it's, it's now possible to create uh, one-dimensional artworks. This is one-dimensional AR for real. It's, it's there at the Boston Cyber Arts Festival um, here in London. <laughs> and there's been a lot of discussion about this thing. Is it, is it, 
is it possible, yes or no? I, I think it's the tiniest undividable thing, a pixel by default. Um, and it, it has a time, it, it has a place, it has a position now, but it doesn't really have a direction, it's just there, it's one pixel. But maybe you can also think about that, if this is true or not. If it's now possible to make one dimensional AR, I think it is. Um, and that's sort of, yeah, it's my, my conclusion that I, I think anything is possible now. You can either extend universally or get to the smallest point and create things that were previously not possible yet. So that's my last slide. Right, thank you.